My name's Eddie Hooker. I'm the CEO of Hamilton Fraser Insurance uh, on the cosmetic side. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about how to be a recording artist. And as I, I think you'll probably realise by now, I'm not going to teach you how to sing uh, or play in a band. I'm going to talk today uh, a little bit about patient notes, medical records and consenting. This is the, uh, the business side of the of the conference. Um, we deal with insurance, we pick up uh, the problems when things go wrong. Um, so I thought we'd spend five, ten minutes just talking a little bit about uh, good record keeping and uh, taking adequate notes. Okay, now I've got quite a lot of information. I'm not going to uh, go through every slide point uh, on, the, on the presentation. I want to talk more generally about um, record keeping, why you should keep good records, and uh, what sort of style of records you should be keeping. Okay? Now, I want to make it very quite clear quite quickly that um, I'm not going to sit and talk about doom and gloom and what type of practitioners are the best at performing and um, what the size of claims are and how bad they can be. Generally speaking, Cosmetic procedures are very, very safe. The problems are that a lot of practitioners not are incompetent at what they're doing or are making mistakes in what they're doing, but when something does go wrong, insurers, lawyers, litigation people look for evidence. And they look to see who did what, where and when. And ultimately, when it all comes down to it, if something happens, it's going to be your name, again, your word against the word of the claimant. So quite clearly, the better record keeping you can have and the more concise and complete record uh, uh, keeping you can have, the better your chances of defending any allegations if they come up against you okay so it's i'm not going to sit here trying to frighten everybody that um you know if you don't do this and you don't do that the world's going to end um but it's just some food to thought the more information that you can take the better your chances if something happens over the last 15 years we've seen quite a dramatic rise in the number of claims coming from the aesthetic market. In fact, I think all insurers and all defence bodies have seen that rise as well. And a lot of these claims are being settled because of inadequate record keeping by the practitioner. Without your records, we can't defend you. As I said before, it's all a matter of who said what, where and when. And I, do, I go around the country doing talks quite regularly and I talk next to lawyers, I talk next to barristers and it is a criticism in the cosmetic market, in the medical market. We all hear the jokes about uh, um, illegible notes written down by doctors and dentists and people like that. But that is a fair criticism because it's the, uh, it's the lawyers and the barristers that are having to decipher the record keeping or try and work out where the problem occurred, the type of patient, the type of treatment and was it consented correctly. So it is very, very important that we, that we understand what we're trying to do. So why do we actually keep records at all? Well, it's not just in case something goes wrong, it's so that you guys can understand your patient a lot better, you can direct care a lot better. Uh, you can pass over the case to colleagues, uh, you can take on new cases from other doctors and other practitioners. As I said, it does help with complaints, inquiries and of course litigation. If you're ever audited by your uh, 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 defence body, if you ever have a complaint, not, not a malpractice claim or a, a claim of, uh, of bodily injury, but any form of audit uh, or investigation against you, if you've got those records, it's very, very easy to pass them over and help your own case. 
And then there's obviously research and, all, uh, uh, and national statistics and those sort of things, which always come in handy. I'm not going to talk about those last couple of bits. We're going to concentrate on the care and the, uh, uh, the malpractice bit, the negligence bit, the complaints. I always say that trying to defend a claim, if it ever comes against you, happens right at the beginning. Yeah? You're not there to deal with a claim or try and defend yourself once it's happened. Once it's happened, it's happened. And then it's a, a matter of, uh, of damage limitation. So really, at the end of the day, it's trying to get as much information up front about that client, about that patient, and ongoing throughout the history of your treatments with them, um, down in writing, down on your computer systems, down in your notes. So that's very, very important that as soon as someone walks through the door, you're starting to take records, okay? Consenting's a big issue in the market at the, at the moment, and I've got no magic solution for you guys as to what is an adequate consenting document. You need to check that with your own lawyers, with your own trade bodies, your own uh, 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 defence bodies. But ultimately, you do need to work a lot more on consenting with the practitioner. Remember, with cosmetic procedures, they are elective in the majority of cases. So they're not like a normal medical condition. Um, they, people actually want these treatments. Uh, and they're coming to you with their own perceived knowledge. So a lot of people will have gone onto the internet, they'll bring in photos of, uh, of Brad Pitt or anyone else and say, that's what I want to look like, yeah? They will have expectations that may be far greater than the results of any procedure that can be achieved. So it's very important that you spend a lot of time initially with your patient, making sure that you understand them, you understand the reasons why they're doing the treatment, and you explain clearly the options to them. Pre-printed documentation from the manufacturer or, or, or your own documentation can always be helpful, okay? And that documentation should explain what the procedure is, what the makeup of that product are, is, what the expected length uh, of effectiveness that product will have. Uh, what are the downsides of that product and the procedure? Is there any pain involved? Yeah? Is, there a, a, is there any information out in the market as to success rate? All of those sorts of things. And if possible, I would always suggest that when you have your first meeting with your client, and I'm sure you all do, you don't do the treatment the same day you send them back, you send them home. The other thing which is very, very important is make notes of who is attending those meetings with you. We all have a, a, a bit of a laugh and a joke about it, but actually a lot of claims, the claimant is whipped up by family and friends who happen to turn up. How many times have you sat there with uh, a, a young lady and maybe her mother or the boyfriend who are egging them on, pushing them to do this type of treatment, etc., etc., etc.? So if there is anybody, uh, anybody else with them, a good tip is to ask the other person to step outside while you have a one-to-one -one conversation with uh, the individual that wants the treatment or certainly you're going to have to record all of the information and comments made by the other people that are there. Photographs is another fantastic thing. Before and after photographs, very, very important. Okay, so with technology now, even with mobile phones with cameras uh, uh, on them, it is no excuse now that you can't take a before photograph. And obviously in the medical world, there are lots of different uh, solutions for photography, from 3D imaging right the way through to standard, uh, standard Polaroid style before and after pictures. Therefore, if something goes wrong at the end, when the treatment's done, you've got something to refer back. This all sounds common sense, doesn't it? You would be absolutely shocked if I showed you the number of claim files we see where we have no photographs and inadequate notes. 
make sure that you keep copies of everything. Now, I'm sure you're all computerised. There's nothing wrong with not being computerised. Uh, some of the best uh, record systems are manual. But however you do it, you need to keep them. And I think you need to keep them for at least 10 years um, in, a locked, in a locked system, in a locked cabinet. Or if they're on a computer system, you need to back up that data. Yeah? Especially if, it, as a claimant, has three to four years, sometimes up to five years, to make a claim against you. Right? And then the insurance companies and the lawyers will always come back and ask for copies. Make sure you keep the records up to date. So not just the first time you see them, every time they come back for, for a post-treatment or for a second treatment, make sure you keep those notes. I've already mentioned the, uh, the contacts, make sure they're there. Um, the normal medical issues you would always talk about. Yeah? So that's the, uh, their, their uh, medical history, any allergies. Have a look at patch, te patch testing if, you, if, if that's important, but make sure that's all recorded. If you do make a mistake, uh, to your own personal, if, you're on a if it's on a computer, then uh, obviously just take it out. But if you do write things down, make sure that you're not squiggling it out. Very tidy notes is, uh, is very, very important. Make sure that your notes are not, slang, uh, are not jargon and slang or anything else like that. Make sure that they're quite straightforward. Now, I'll tell you the reason for that is that obviously at the end of the day, if we're defending a claim for you, if a lawyer's defending a claim for you, they will know those abbrevi abbreviations, they will know that slang, yeah? But at the end of it, we want you to get the patient to sign that those notes are accurate. If you can get a signature, on your notes, on the consenting forms, on the information you're providing them, yeah, then that adds so much weight to any defence that you may have at the end. Okay? So make them straightforward. Obviously, you're going to need to use medical uh, terminology, but keep it as simple as you, as you possibly can. And of course, make sure that you're not being insulting to the, uh, <laughs> to the patient, especially if they're going to have a look at it at the end, or that they can have access to those notes at any time going forward. Okay, a couple of things. Just um, It's not just about bodily injury we're trying to defend. Uh, here's one situation. It's only brief information. Mobile nurse left her records in her car. They were stolen no records at all. So if anything had happened uh, with a the procedure, then she'd have had no evidence at all to provide. So take backups. Yeah? Make sure that if you've got paper records, you're photocopying them, you're always storing them back at your, uh, at your home or your main place of work. A doctor, recent, cla recent three claims from a doctor, lost all of them, or certainly the defence costs were very, very, very high and we struggled to adequately defend because he had no patient notes, very few. Yeah? And his consenting, he said he spoke to the, uh, to the patient, he said he spent quite a lot of time with the patient, but there was no evidence to it. It came back down to that issue of who said w what, where and when. And the way the UK law system works is that the weight of evidence to prove you haven't done something lies with you. You have to prove that you followed the procedure. Yeah? The patient can just sit there and say, it's all gone wrong. Yeah? It's up to you to prove that you did it right. Yeah? When a large claim comes in, it's common practice now for lawyers, barristers and insurers to get expert witnesses. And those expert witnesses will generally be a practitioner that uh, is maybe, if you're a nurse, they'll bring in a doctor or a plastic surgeon. Yeah? So they're just going to sit there in, in, the, uh, in, in the meetings and just turn around and say, well, you didn't, how do you know, how do I know you said that? Yeah? Or those mm -hmm. notes, are, that's not the not sort of notes we would keep. So it's very, very important that we get a grip with all of this information. So, finally...
coming to the end now. So what happens if you don't? We've talked about this over the last 10, 15 minutes. What happens if you don't keep medical records or adequate medical records? Well, it, as I've said all the way through, it will affect your chance of your case being successful. Yeah? And then you'll have the anger and the anguish and the upset that you did nothing wrong, but it still went against you. 65% of all claim values are lawyer's fees. Actually, the claimant gets very little. Yeah? So you need to make it a lot more easy. And most of that money is spent back and forth trying to find out where it went wrong. You have a duty under your policy, if you have an insurance policy, or even if you're with a defence body, to keep adequate medical notes. If you don't, then the insurer could wiggle out of a claim. Or certainly, if they don't wiggle out of a claim and they have to pay out, your pricing is going to shoot through the roof at subsequent renewals. With the marketplace changing over the next 12 months in terms of which defence bodies, which trade bodies, which insurers will offer out insurance to their members and their practitioner types, it's becoming quite restrictive. Yeah? So you need to make sure that you've got insurance and it's the right insurance and the last thing you want is for that insurance not to pay out or to respond because you haven't kept adequate notes. Okay, so I'm sure all of us and all of you guys, you are taking good records. But all I would ask is that sometime next week when you've come away from this conference, you just go back and have a look at what sort of note taking you're doing, how you're taking that note, what information you're providing and how you are storing it. Okay. And that really um, uh, uh, is it. So I've got a few minutes if you want to ask any questions. We've got a roaming microphone if anybody wants. You can ask anything as long as it's to do with um, whatever. I know that the norm is to do paper. Hold on, should we wait till the, uh, sorry, thank you, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. My question is, I know that the norm is to do paper consent forms. Yeah. I was wondering whether you could video the consultations. Mm. Yeah, you can. You'd need to ask permission from the patient. Yeah? You can't sit there um, with just a camera going in the, in the, uh, in the, um, uh, for a camera to sit in the, in the, in the treatment room. Uh, and then you have a chat with them and then say, right, don't worry about everything. I've videoed. Um, there. The, other, the other, only other downside with video evidence is that, technically speaking, you'd have to play that back to the patient before they left to say, are you happy with what you have said? Yeah? So I would always say, personally, go down the route of giving out the information in as much hard foot copy as you can. And remember what I said back at the beginning, try not to do the treatment in the same session as the consenting. Let them take the consent form, let them take the documentation away with them, let them come back with questions before they uh, start with the, uh, with the procedure. Okay, but you can use video evidence, but ultimately I w you, it's a probably a little bit more long-winded and you've got to be treading a little bit carefully. Any other questions? Oh, there's a couple, couple there. Hi, um, I just wanted to know, for the botulin toxin treatments, yes. I generally take a yearly consent, so it's about every three or four treatments. Right, yep, 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 yep. Is that adequate, or should I be doing it every time? Do you know what? Ideally, every time that patient comes back to you, uh, you should be reconsenting. Okay. I'll be open with you. Yeah, we've had this debate for the last three, four years in the industry about how often should you be consenting. Well, it, again, it depends really on what circumstances have changed with that patient. So if the patient has put weight on, if the patient has developed any other symptoms, if they are starting a 
a, tre a course of other drugs. Maybe they're on uh, a penicillin, maybe they're on other, if their lifestyle changed. So even though you're booking up treatments of, uh, of, of botulinum toxin or any other type of filler um, over a course of a year, and I understand that, and you can give discounts on pricing for that and keep them coming back, really, you should be sitting down. And even if it's a, uh, a, the open word, so anything changed since we last did this, but you're making, making a note. I don't think you would, it would be expected for you to do the whole consenting process, but certainly update, update your records, which I'm sure you would do naturally, but record that. I think you'd be on I, dodgy ground if you said, oh, I, I did that always can, ago. I always record that nothing's changed exactly. since the last... Exactly, yeah. But you may, need to, you may need to say, that's what you said. Why don't you do it that way? That's what you said back in January. Has anything changed? Let me know. Sign again that nothing has changed or something has changed and you can then move on. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to know all the... Do we need to register with the ICO? The Information Commissioning Officer. Say that again, Mr. First bit. Do we need to all register with the ICO? The well, if you're keeping personal records, then you need to be data protection registered. Okay, so you will need to register, especially if you're keeping any financial information on them, if you're keeping any personal information on them, then you will need to think about um, uh, there's actually a category under the ICO, under the Data Protection Commissioner. Uh, to, it's only 35 quid right, to register and you can do it all online and I think there is a medical category okay so then you and you renew that they do it they do it uh, automatically renew so yes I would advise if you're keeping any information personal or financial which you probably will then you will need to be uh, registered with the data protection and if if you're not then the data protection officer the fines are quite quite hefty but that is a very good point very good point yeah. you mentioned about uh, insurance shooting up yeah does unsuccessful claims and complaints affect one's insurance ultimately it will yes I know there is the uh, the age-old adage that the premiums of the many pay for the claims of the few and it shouldn't be particularly fair that you buy insurance that um, uh, as soon as you use it the price goes up general claim large claims generally don't affect your insurance premium so if you were to spend five thousand quid on insurance and you end up putting a half a million pound claim in then generally speaking the price won't change what insurers look at is frequency of claims and then they look at the profitability of the overall pool of premiums paid by everybody. Yeah? And then they work out the figures of how much money, what return are they getting on that pool of premium. Okay? So, yes, you, your pricing will be affected with multiple claims coming through over a period of time. Generally speaking, it won't change if you have a large claim but if the industry starts claiming more and as I said in my presentation that we've seen claims going up tenfold in the last few years some of that is due to the practitioner numbers going up there's more of you guys doing it but ultimately the claim levels and the claim frequencies are increasing yeah that's our concern going forward very quickly, we were, we were notified with a claim only last week where a filler uh, um, had migrated into the brain area of the patient. That claim, you're looking at a million pound plus. Yeah, We've got to defend that. It is happening, and it's not happening. Uh, these claims aren't coming from your uh, beauty area of the market. These claims are coming from your professional doctor, dentist, nurse practitioner, nurse prescribing area, because that's all we do, so we don't do anything else. So those three core competencies, we are seeing claims coming through. We're having to defend them. Yeah? Links nicely back to as much information as you can get about your patient, the better. Okay, I think, um, have we got one, time for one more and then that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I 
just wondered if you know anything about the RCN pulling out of insurance deals. Right. Yes, deals right. The RCN, as of um, the 1st of July, I think it's the 1st of July, have announced that they will no longer be providing um, medical indemnity for um, cosmetic procedures. Okay? Um, and there's other little rinky dinks of what they're not going to do as well. So uh, they're not going to pick up any commercial uh, uh, business insurance or anything else like that. Don't panic, yeah, because you're covered up until the 1st of July. But then you've got people like us, and we've been dealing with um, nurses and dentists and doctors in this specific. We're not a general medical insurer. We are an aesthetic cosmetic in So that's all we do is for botulinum toxin fillers, laser work, that sort of thing. And we can pick up your policy from or pick up your coverage from the 1st of July if that's what you want. I'd also, we've set up a helpline. Uh, if you go onto our website or go to our stand dot number 64, we've got a helpline. Uh, I think it's a free phone helpline that we, if you've got any concerns, give us a call and we'll go through it with you. But there should be no panic for you. Yeah, I just think the reason they've done it is they can't make money at it because the volume of claims, it just mirrors what I've just said. Yeah, but have a chat with us on 64. Can I just say thank you very much for your time? I'm going to leave you with one thought, right? And then I'll, I'll, I'll get off the podium and then on to the next one. We've talked a lot about record keeping. We've talked a lot about uh, patient notes and all of that thing. Well, the only tip I'm going to give you is... It's from the heart. It's from your gut feeling. If you have a patient that you have a feeling is going to cause you a problem, yeah, push them down to the practitioner down the road. It doesn't matter what they're paying. If they're going to be argumentative, if they're going to be rude, if they're going to be pushy, if you just have that feel, oh my God, I don't want to do this, I don't care what they pay you, don't do it. And that... I guarantee you will keep the whole industry claim levels down. All right, thank you very much for your time, guys. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.